In the last video, we looked at differential rate laws, which related the rate of a reaction expressed as a derivative, that is the instantaneous rate, something like d molarity of p dt, to the concentrations of reactants in solutions, something like Ka squared, for example, for a second order reaction. In this video, we're going to look at the integrated rate laws, which are called as much because we arrive at them by integrating both sides of this equation. The beauty of integrated rate laws is that this derivative disappears and we end up with some relationship between the concentration of P and time. This equation shows us how the concentration of P varies with time and we can make direct comparisons to experimental data of concentration versus time to come to conclusions about, for example, the order of a reactant. In the practical study of chemical kinetics, we measure concentrations versus time for one of the reactants or products, for example, the concentration of a product over time. However, the differential rate laws that we've seen so far actually don't directly relate concentration and time. Instead, they deal in derivatives, dp dt. This derivative is a derivative of a function we don't know yet, how the concentration of p varies with time. And so if we want to directly compare experimental data to something theoretical, we need to move past or move beyond the differential rate law. So how do we make time t appear in a differential rate law? Well, the idea is to express the standard rate in terms of a reactant A, separate all the molarity of A terms and all the time terms, and integrate. We can do this for any of the three differential rate laws that we've seen already. So consider the zero order case. When looking at the zero order case originally, we expressed the rate as 1 over C dc dt or dx dt. This is the standard rate either in terms of C, a product, or x, the number of reaction events. To make this integration process work well, we want to express everything in terms of the concentration of one of the reactants, which is also going to appear over on the right hand side in the general case when the order is not zero. In this case, the rate law reduces to the standard rate, negative 1 over a dA dt, is equal to k a to the zero power, which is always equal to 1, no matter the value of a, and so that's simply equal to a constant k. We can move t to the other side by multiplying both sides by dt, and we get d molarity of a is equal to negative a times k dt. We've also multiplied both sides by negative a to achieve this. And then we can integrate both sides. We integrate the left-hand side with respect to the molarity of A, and we integrate the right-hand side with respect to time. Essentially, we're adding up all the concentrations and all the time points as we move infinitesimally along the concentration versus time curve. When we do this, since A does not appear on the left, all that appears there is dA, when we integrate between A and A0, we get the molarity of A minus the initial molarity of A. That's what this zero subscript is meant to denote. Moving that to the other side and integrating over here, we get T minus T zero for this integral. And so we find that the concentration of A at any time point is equal to minus AK, T minus T zero. T zero is usually set to zero so that minus AKT just appears there, plus the initial concentration, and this should make sense, a is a reactant, so A is disappearing. That's why there's the negative sign here. The initial concentration at the time T equals zero, when this whole first term is equal to zero, that's A zero. So this bottom equation is exactly the form that we would expect if we were to plot the concentration of A versus time for a zero order process. Namely, the concentration of A decreases linearly from an initial value A zero depending on how we set the reaction up, such that the slope of this line is equal to negative the stoichiometric coefficient times the rate constant k. This equation at the bottom, which relates the concentration of A at any time point to the time at which we're making the measurement, is called an integrated rate law. And integrated rate laws are critical for experimental determination of reaction orders. You can imagine that this is an equation that suggests a model. It suggests m equals zero and we can try to fit experimental data to this starred model equation to see if our data suggests m equals zero in actuality. When a is first order, we find that the molarity of a decays exponentially with time, which is another picture that we've seen. We now have a factor of a to the first power instead of a to the zero power there, and we're gonna go through the same process of bringing t to the other side 
by multiplying both sides by dt and then integrating both sides. When we do that, we get the integral of dA over A between the initial and final or concentration of interest. The integral of 1 over A dA is the natural log of A, and collecting both natural logs into a single natural log, we get that the natural log of a over a0 is equal to the right-hand side, minus k and a are constants. We multiplied both sides by negative a. That's why we got the negative a factor over here. And we integrate between t and t0 to get t minus t0 on the right. Usually t0 is just 0. We're starting the experiment at time t0 equals 0. And if we do e to the power of both sides of this and then multiply both sides by a0, we find that the concentration of a at a general time point, at any time during the experiment, is equal to the initial concentration times e to the negative k a t minus t0. And if t0 is 0, this just becomes e to the minus k a t. In graphical form, this looks like an exponential function. Concentration of a on the y-axis and time on the x-axis, we again start at a concentration a0. And you'll notice that at time t equals 0, t minus t0 is equal to 0, so the entire argument of the exponential is equal to 0, such that this whole term, the whole exponential, is equal to 1. So that the initial concentration is equal to a0, which is exactly what we would expect. This decays exponentially. As time goes on, the concentration of a decays exponentially, like so. The steepness with which this decrease occurs depends on k. The larger k is, the faster a decrease we're going to see. So for example, for a larger value of k, we're going to see a steeper decrease, something like this I'm drawing in red. As I alluded to before, to determine the order of A empirically from experimental data, we can fit experimental concentration versus time data to this model using the rate constant as a parameter. And I won't go into the mathematical details of exactly how to do this, but essentially what we do is we allow k to take on any value and see how good a fit we can achieve using the optimal value of k and assuming that the model is first order, assuming that it fits this exponential function. If this model fits, for example, better than the zero order model, we could conclude that the order of the reaction is 1, m is equal to 1. When a is second order, the setup is again the same as the zero and first order cases, except now we have an exponent of 2 on the molarity of A instead of an exponent of 1. We again multiply both sides by negative A dt, bringing dt and negative A to the other side. We divide both sides by A squared, bringing A over to the left-hand side, and we get an integral between A and A0 of dA over A squared is equal to minus Ka, a constant, times the integral between t and t0 of dt. The integral of 1 over x squared dx is equal to negative 1 over x plus c. And so this definite integral with a0 as the lower limit comes out to negative 1 over a minus 1 over a0. And that's equal to the usual expression on the right, which is minus ka t minus t0. And doing a little bit of rearranging, we find that 1 over a is equal to ka t minus t0 plus 1 over a0. So this is a somewhat more unique form relative to the other two, I would say, but it still suggests the same idea of a curve, a decaying curve. In graphical form, second order decay would look something like this. We still have an initial concentration of a0 at time t equals 0. Why does that work? Well, this term drops out to 0 here, and so if this whole term is 0, 1 over a is 1 over a0, and a equals a0 at that initial time point. Similar to the exponential case, we get rapid decay early in the reaction, tapering off as the reaction progresses, and this curve has the form that 1 over the concentration at any time point is equal to kt minus t0. This seems to suggest that a is increasing since this t minus t0 term is going to be increasing as time moves forward, but note that there is a 1 over a on the left-hand side, and so an increasing value on the right indicates that the molarity of A is decreasing, which is what we would expect. Just like we did for the first order model, we can determine the order of A empirically by fitting experimental concentration versus time data to this model and seeing if it fits better than the zero or first order cases. 
If it does, we can conclude that this reaction is, for example, second order in A. Finally, I want to compare the kinetics models that we've developed so far, the zero order, first order, and second order models, for the same value of the rate constant, 0 0.1, and the same initial concentration, 0 0.25 molar. The graphs we're seeing here are the molarity of A on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. What we find is that the zero order process is very rapid, decaying very rapidly until no reactant is left, down here at the bottom, at which point the reaction will stop since we're out of reactants. The first order process is a slower decay that eventually tapers off to zero, far, far out at infinity, in fact. But notice that for the same value of K, it's a slower decline, a slower decline in the concentration than the zero order case. And the second order case is even slower. The decline is even slower for the common K value of 0 0.1. So other things being equal, zero order reactions are most rapid, followed by first order reactions, and then second order reactions, which are the slowest.